I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom He faithfully bore He canceled my debt And he called me his friend When death was arrested And my life began Oh, oh your grace So free Washes over 
Good morning. Welcome to Parkview LPGA. We are so excited that you've decided to join us this morning for worship. Will you stand with us this morning? We're just going to go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your gifts this morning. God, we're so thankful for your blessings, the blessing of beautiful weather and just community and fellowship here at Parkview LPGA. Lord, we just are so in awe of what you've done in this church, God, and we cannot wait to continue to be a part of what you're going to do in the future. God, we just bless your name. We bless your name. You are holy, God. We're so thankful for the grace that you've given us.
sometimes it's difficult to say your will, your way. But let's make that our joy, amen. This will be my joy to say. to be worshiping Jesus this morning. Some of you are, some aren't sure yet. So <laughs> hopefully you'll get excited. Man, I uh, remember the day that I laid it down before the Lord. And that is when I started living. Uh, before that, man, I thought I was living. But uh, once I surrendered fully to Christ, wow, uh, the journey has been amazing. And I hope you can uh, attest to that as well. What a great God we serve. If you're here today for the first time, uh, man, we're uh, excited you're here. We would love to connect with you and would love for you to connect with us. And uh, the way we do that is if you'll take this connect card in the seat next to you, uh, fill it out. Uh, on your way out, you can uh, either drop it in the uh, giving box or you can see Pastor Andrew or stop by the Next Steps tent. If you do that, stop by the Next Steps tent or see Pastor Andrew. We have a gift card uh, that we will exchange you for your Connect card. Uh, just to say thank you for being here today. It's for a half dozen donuts from Duck Donuts. And uh, you will uh, thoroughly enjoy those. I recommend the bacon uh, <laughs> and donuts. And... Uh, and uh, you will not regret it, I promise you. Uh, so I uh, would love to connect with you. You can also go to our website and uh, at parkview, uh, lpga.com. See all the events that are taking place here at our church. A lot is happening uh, here uh, in the life of our church. And like I said, we're excited that you're a part of it today. For our regular attenders, man, I just want to commend you uh, on your giving. Uh, the first quarter of giving has been amazing. And... Um, you say, well, what does that mean? Well, what that means is uh, it uh, allows us to do more ministry. You know, our mission here is guiding people to life change in Christ. And uh, as we, uh, our budgets met, we're able to go out and we're able to uh, minister. And as the budget grows, we're able to minister more uh, to people. And uh, man, thank you for that. Uh, we have our four ways to give. You can text, you can give through our app through the offering uh, box or online. And uh, like I said, thank you so much for your faithfulness uh, in giving. Uh, man, it's just already been a great day. And uh, we're going to continue to worship here in song in just a moment. And uh, Pastor Andrew is going to come and uh, he's going to open up the word as we uh, continue on in our series uh, entitled Triggered. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much. Lord, I think about... Uh, laying our life down before you. Lord, how scary that sounds and seems, and I admit in my life at times there have been uh, those occasions where I just wanted to hold on. 
I did not want to surrender. I did not want to give the situation over to you, the circumstance over to you. And Lord, I thank you that even in those times, Lord, you tenderly loved me and drew me. And Lord, you're always working. Thank you for working on our behalf. Lord, as we continue to worship you today, Lord, we just sing your praises that our hearts are full of joy for who you are, not just for what you've done, but for who you are. Lord, I pray that you'd be with Pastor Andrew as we begin our second uh, sermon on Triggered. Lord, I pray that you would uh, strengthen him. I pray the Holy Spirit would speak through him today, Lord. And uh, Lord, I know that there are those here today who are hurting, who, who need what's coming from your word today. And Lord, I pray that you would encourage them. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. You would stand with us as we continue to worship.
his words to say out of our mouth, but sometimes the most difficult. You are good.
almighty. God, despite the things that may come and the difficulties that may come, God, we know that we stand in the presence of a holy God. We're so thankful, Lord. So thankful that we can bring all of our stuff to your feet. God, and you embrace us with open arms because your grace is sufficient for all my needs. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. church how we doing good to see you today man and blessings to you uh, I am so uh, encouraged by all that God is doing in this place and I could list a thing on top of thing that encourages me about it but uh, the thing on my mind this morning is the number uh, of new people that have joined us in just the last few weeks uh, man Oh, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I should have prepared you. It's first service. I, I wasn't thinking because here's why I know like you're new. You're like, man, this place is weird. Yeah, we are. I, look, we won't hide that, but I had to hold them back. You saw because man, our church, we planted five years ago. And if you just knew half the story, you would know how much our people, when I say our people, the people that have been here, just regular attenders, how much we are just flat out blown away by the move of God in this place. And so much so that it's, it's, it's many, many things, but, but we take it very personally. We take it very, uh, very clearly uh, that God is at work when he brings new people that he's working in here. We count that as a privilege. We often say it this way, that God brings people to churches who are ready uh, to receive them. And uh, I know that's been true in my ministry experience, and we always want to be ready. We always want to have one more seat available for the person that God is working in and drawing. So that to say, if you consider yourself a regular attender here at Parkview, would you make all those who are new feel incredibly welcome today? And if you haven't had your hand shaken 15 times by the time you got to your seat, uh, there's plenty of people that want to hug your neck on the way out. Uh, we kind of got a touchy-feely thing around here. COVID was pretty tough for us. And so we're glad that we are beyond uh, that time, at least for most of us. And so, I uh, mean, it's, it's, um, it's incredible. Uh, it's incredible just to uh, take it all in. And, and we give God all the glory. I'm going to talk about that today. But if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, uh, would you turn to the book of Esther, uh, Esther chapter number three. And as you turn there, uh, I'll reintroduce you. If this is your first week, it's a great week to be here. Uh, we've had so many uh, people uh, come, not even before Easter, not only before Easter, but uh, on and after, that we want to get to know you. Uh, we want to connect with you. And... Um, Last week, we dove into this new series called Triggered. And what we discovered and what we will discover in this uh, six-week series is there are things in your life that are not your fault that may cause you to react in a way that will be your fault. There are things, circumstances, situations as you walk through your daily tasks through your relationships that will just crop up and pop up and you uh, have no fault in that at all you're simply just living your life and then right in front of you or right around you or sometimes even from behind a surprise attack you 
you face a trigger, maybe one that you didn't even expect, you didn't even know to avoid, and it stirs a response inside of you, or maybe even outside of you, that though it's not your fault that the trigger was there, it may not even be your fault that it bothered you, you find that there are going to be consequences that you have to deal with as a result of the way that you reacted. So what do we do with that? What does the Bible say about that? And I encouraged you last week that there are a number of people in the Bible who had the same experience. David had a number of, of triggers that set him off. And, and yet even in his triggered moments, you could say he overreacted just a smidge by prophesying his own crucifixion that didn't even exist yet. But in turn, he was really talking about the Messiah. God took his overreaction moment and he turned it for the glory of his people. And he'll do that for you and he'll do that for me even today. And so we're gonna study a story that deserves an entire series. I love these type of messages where I get to introduce you. Some of you don't even know who Esther is. You don't know uh, where the book is. I saw you gave up turning to it. It's really hard to find, right? Because after you look for about 32 seconds, you just have to close your Bible because you're embarrassed or, or, or open it to some random passage. I've done it before, friend. I'm a pastor. I get it. That's why you got to go buy, buy one of those cheap Bibles with the tabs on it. So then it's like, E-S, okay, there's Esther. It's in a, a, an odd place in the Old Testament, the book of Esther, because it, it realistically happens towards the end of the Old Testament story. We find ourselves some 500 years before the time of Christ. We're only around 500 BC. This is really more recent history, Old Testament wise. Um, and you find her story coupled with Ezra and Nehemiah because this is kind of the rebuilding and the, the Persian exile. So if I'm speaking your language, this is just to give you context of where we are. God's people have been through the gambit. They have experienced the, the fullness of turmoil and trials and persecution, and yet it's not over still. So the book of Esther is a, a, a relatively short 10-chapter book where in this book, uh, it's the only book of the 66 in the entire Bible, Old and New Testament, that has something so unique about it, theologians still don't know what to do with it. We scratch our head today as readers of the Bible. It's the only book in the entire Bible that never mentions God. Now that seems odd to me. <laughs> If I'm going to read the Bible, I expect to read about God, but in 10 chapters, his name is never mentioned. But let me tell you this, church, he's on every page. He's all over the book of Esther. As a matter of fact, what you're going to see is I kind of tell you the story and we lean into the, the triggers that are there and how they will affect you. What I want you to also see is that God's sovereignty fills every word of the story. Maybe that word is new to you, God's sovereignty. What does that mean? Is that just an Old Testament word? No, friend, that's a word even for today. That means that God is in charge, especially when it seems like he's not. When you're looking around the 10 chapters of your current season, the 10 chapters of your life, and you can't quite find the name of God, when you're like, God, where are you right now? I've seen you before and I believe I'll see you again, but I don't see you. I don't feel you. I, I don't sense your presence, God. Where are you? The book of Esther tells us he's right there. He's right with you. It's all over every chapter, every page of the book of Esther. See, God's people are in what we call the Persian exile. This is the kind of last period you see before the Old Testament silence, before the, the takedown, if you will, of the, uh, of the rebuild, and they'll end up later in Roman uh, captivity when you get into Jesus' time. And in this moment, uh, you've got a, a, a king by the name of Xerxes. You might have heard of Xerxes before, even from popular movies. Uh, king Ahasuerus is what he's called in the story. Same guy. Uh, the most powerful Persian king that we've ever read about, that we've ever known, that had ever been in power. And yet God's people, enslaved to the Persians, cried out for years, for decades, God, what will you do? 
This is a wicked nation. As wicked as Babylon, as, as wicked as, as the enemies of the Old Testament they had faced, so godless, so unknowing of the God of the universe, and yet God's people are stuck here. And in the midst of the chaos, you'll, you'll, if you read the rest of the story, I told you it deserves an entire series itself, but let me just hit the high points. King Xerxes calls on his wife Vashti uh, to perform for him. You can imagine what the culture 2,500 years ago would have uh, said about that, how they devalued the role of wife or, or woman. And when she chose to stand up and to not do that, she was, she was eliminated from the kingdom. He could have taken her life. He, I guess, showed maybe a, a, an ounce, a thimble full of mercy not to kill her, but, but he banished her from the kingdom, his own wife. And then he starts some kind of a modern-day reality dating TV show where he calls for 400 of the fairest ladies of the land. And of them, Esther is one. Now, that might cause your blood to boil. How could Esther be so objectified to be one of the 400, let, let alone to play part in this pagan game? How, how would this work out in any way for God's people? But what you find by the end of this moment that of the 400 the king was most drawn to his eye was most caught by the the jewish girl esther and he invited her into the kingdom he invited her if you will to be his wife and there's so much to tease out there to understand why would god do it this way but but let me tell you friend the jews esther saw this as their only bastion of hope we are lost in this land we have no representation. There is no authority in our name. And one of us just entered the kingdom. As this is happening, almost simultaneously, there is a coup to take out the king. Two men outside of the gates are debating how they'll go in and they'll assassinate King Xerxes. And a man named Mordecai, who was the cousin of Esther, he heard this. And it may have been to his benefit for Xerxes to be removed from authority. Maybe he thought in his mind, this is how God will set us free. But God said, that's not the way, Mordecai. That's not okay. You must warn the king. So he sent word through Esther of this, of this grand plan to assassinate the king. And they went and they investigated the matter. And upon investigation, they found out Mordecai's word was true. And they... They put those two men to death for the threat of treason. They were taken out, and it was remembered that day. But, but hang on to this for a moment. I'm going to come back to this by the end. Mordecai was never rewarded for his act of saving the king. He was remembered, but not rewarded. You ever feel like you're remembered, but you weren't rewarded? I mean, you know God knows who you are. You know God remembers your name, but you're thinking, God, I've been serving you for a long time, and I feel like I've not been rewarded. I feel like I'm kind of getting the short end of the stick here, God, because, because I go to church with a lot of people that are worse than me, and they got rewarded. You're not supposed to think that, but I know you do. So, so what do you do when you're Mordecai and you're remembered but not rewarded, and your cousin uh, or niece, as sometimes it's interpreted, your, your close family member is in the palace. She's close to the king, but yet there is no relief. And then the guy that you detest the most, the guy that least deserves it with, uh, within all the kingdom, who, who has practiced nepotism for sure. He's rode every coattail. He's climbed over every individual for every promotion he's ever gotten. His name is Haman, <clears throat> and he is promoted to number two in the kingdom, sitting second only to Xerxes. He now sits number two in the kingdom. And there's a great decree that goes out through all of Persia that says not only will you honor Xerxes, but, but anyone other than Xerxes, everyone has to bow down to Haman. Haman had worked his whole life, or maybe avoided work his whole life, to get this promotion, to get this position, and now he's finally there. And he's going to exercise every piece of authority with it. But let me just tell you this. If you don't know this story, and I'm assuming many of you don't, 
Haman's greatest success in life will ultimately become his greatest defeat. Haman was doing just fine until he got the thing he always wanted. And once he got the thing he always wanted, it would eventually end up in his ruin because of one thing in his life. And the one thing is the thing that every one of us battles in a different way or another. It is the issue of pride. You're going to see pride crop up in Haman's life. Probably a guy they did not enjoy that no one liked anyway. But, but before Esther and after Esther, you never hear about Haman again. There is no great history. There's no great uh, moral to the story of Haman besides what's recorded in these 10 chapters. But I'll tell you this today. If you have a Jewish friend and you're looking to make conversation with them, simply ask them what they think about Haman. In the Jewish hall of shame, it goes like this. Hitler, Nero, Haman. I mean, he got the bronze medal of hatred from the Jewish people. You got me? This guy is abhorred still today by the Jewish nation. He, he took the, the third level in the Olympics of, of, of anger towards God's people and the way that he attempted to devastate them. And I'm going to share that with you today. But the only reason this is true, that he would go from great success in his life as a complete ungodly man, as, a, as someone who completely disregarded the existence of God, but even still, success could have been his had it not been for pride. Solomon, the wisest man ever, said this in Proverbs 11:2: when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. Now, I don't think this is hard. If I asked you today, I have two gifts for you on stage. I'll give you one or the other, but you can't have both. You get humility with wisdom, or you get a box of disgrace. I think you'll take the wisdom and humility. And, and the formula is here, but we see, how, we see how Haman misses it. And the truth is, church, it's easy to pick on Haman this morning, but the reality is I need, I need the Holy Spirit to pick on me. I need the Holy Spirit to pick on you because it's so easy to see pride in others. As a matter of fact, the easiest way to detect for pride is to look for it in everybody else. I rarely find it in me, but I can almost always find it in you. And I feel like you're the same but this matters for a thousand reasons, but the reason in Esther this morning that we want to deal with this is because success will always, say always, any success you have in life, any success you want in life, any success you attain to will always be eclipsed by failure when pride is triggered. As a matter of fact, that's what makes pride so sneaky, so subtle, and so quiet. Of all the other issues and conditions that we'll talk about like last week was was loneliness or or uh, isolation and we'll talk about anger and depression and grief we're going to hit all the high spots in this series but what makes pride sneaky about them is the other ones tend to hit when you're at your lowest point when you're down in the dumps and and you feel like you can't take anything else that's when triggers begin to hit that cause those other issues, but pride is the one that will hit you on your best day rather than your worst day. As a matter of fact, what pride likes to do is it likes to make your best day become your worst day. And this happens in Haman's life. Join me in chapter three, verse one, where we pick up the rest of the story. After these things, it's written, King Ahasuerus or Xerxes promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamathita, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai, he did not bow down and he did not pay homage. See, there are many things in your life that could trigger pride, but in this story, it's very clear to me that, that the first trigger that Haman either didn't anticipate or didn't prepare for is that of promotion. Promotion often leads to pride in your life. I'm telling you, church, you've got to watch out now. 
when things are going well, when, when the ticker is up, when, when the day is, is great, when you are about to finally get the thing you've been working for, waiting for, saving for, all the effort is about to pay off. And good for you, none of that is bad. But just know what lurks around the corner is the trigger of pride. You say, well, what's so bad about that? I mean, I did, I did work really hard. I saved my whole life. I mean, I put everything into this. What would be so wrong with pride? I'm going to show you how that plays out in Haman's life. But before I do, I want to kind of dissect how it, how it sneaks in. I, I was thinking about it this week, how advancement in your life is, is what tends to bring on pride. It turns the focus off of the result and it puts it on uh, the person who receives the result. That's why the word I is the most common word uh, when you're thinking of the condition of pride, the sin of pride in your life, I will be said over and over again. I mentioned it earlier and I don't wanna ever skip over this. What has happened in our church is uh, beyond description. We started five years ago and uh, we were very mediocre for the first three years of our existence. That's why some of you are like, you've been here five years, are you sure? I don't really know, I, I think so, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but we had about 100 people, of which uh, half of them came from our sending church, and we spent three years through COVID just trying to rebuild, trying to be about it. As a matter of fact, I, I texted our staff this week, it was kind of funny, um, last week, the week after Easter, which is usually a down week, because everybody got their church credit on Easter, right? So they don't have to necessarily come the next week. So kudos to you if you came last week. And this week, you're doubling down. That's crazy. We don't, don't even know to do that. But we, we tell you all the time that, that nickels and noses aren't the measure of our success. And we say that on purpose. And we, man, we mean it. We live it out. But we do monitor those things. It, it matters where you are. It matters. Um, the, the, they're an indicator, if you will, of where we are. They're not the, the result of success, but last week the attendance came through and we had, uh, we had 297 people in both services. And I thought, man, that's so cool. So I texted our staff and I said, hey, you remember? You remember when we only had 97 people at church? That was a really common number, by the way. As a matter of fact, we were about to start a new ministry where we went out and we paid people to come to church because <laughs> I only needed three. You know, I thought, man, if I could find three people off of LPGA Boulevard that for 20 bucks, I could pay him to come. Like, cause if you come for five minutes, we count you. You don't even have to come for the whole thing. I don't know if you knew that or not. So you can just kind of pick the five minutes that you want, but don't, don't do that please. But, but it, it's kind of true. So, it, I mean, you get counted. So we thought, man, I mean, we were asking ladies like, okay, um, are you expecting, which got awkward for some of our friends that live in Margaritaville. And so, <laughs> you know, but assuming that you were expecting also, that didn't go well for us. And so we're like, because it, I mean, man, we count life from conception. So we're like, we'll count you as double. And so maybe triple if we think it's twins, you know, by faith, we'll talk about that. I mean, I'm telling you, these are the fun days of church planting, but we were running 97. I thought, if we could just get three more, why? Because a hundred just sounds like way more than 97. I mean, talking about the definition of petty, just go plant a church and you'll find out what petty is. But Man, we laughed, we joked about it because for the better part of the three years, we just bounced right up against the 100, but, but never would uh, surpass that. And there's too many reasons that's true. And we were, we were fine with it, man. We were so excited about what God was doing here. Never discouraged, never deterred. Really didn't think twice, just God, whatever you want to do. And so then for last week, for us to have 297, my first thought was not can we get three more to get to 300? That was not, I know that's where you thought I was going. No, I did ask a few ladies if they were pregnant, but that was beside the point. My wife has banned me from asking that question. And so that was not my first thought. My, my first thought was, and I said this to the staff, do you realize it was 20 months ago that we had 97 here? A year and a half and God has tripled what he's doing here. And, and listen, our people, 
that were here and our people that have come since. That's why they get so excited about, about new folks, about life change when we tell you that people are getting saved. I mean, people I've met with recently, guys, like I can't, I'm bubbling over to tell you their story and I'm only holding it back because their stories are coming soon. Like what God is doing here is it's immeasurable, it's, it's, it's remarkable, but it is so easy. It, it will be so easy for you to say, look what I did. Look, look, look at the way I served. I mean, that church couldn't, couldn't be what they are without me. If I hadn't have given what I gave, we wouldn't be buying the land. It wouldn't be uh, the mission of life change that it is if God hadn't uh, blessed them with my presence. <laughs> it's amazing. Now, I'm guessing none of you have actually thought that. If you have, I want to counsel with you after church because that's... <laughs> That's pretty dark. I get it. We don't go that far. But isn't it interesting how the seed can enter in? Man, especially those that were here in the beginning days that worked so hard and, 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 and really put into uh, the planting and the watering, wanting God to give increase. It's so easy when God gives increase, increase for us to stand back and take credit. And I'll tell you, I, I say that to you because I say it to our staff and I say it to God on behalf of me and all of us. We have said from the beginning that we want God to do something so big here that only he gets the credit for. And he will do that, listen to me church, he will do that until we start taking credit for it. He says, you wanna take credit? The reward is yours and I'm done here. I can't tell you how many times a week I give you back to God, I do. God, they're your problem. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. <laughs> Ain't mine. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, that's, I'm not doing that. It's, why? Because this is God's church. This is God's church. It's not my church. It's not our staff's church. It's not our elders' church. It's not our finance team's church. This is God's church. And we are so excited about what he's doing here, but man, we cannot let pride creep in because promotion, advancement, the goodness of your life can be a trigger to pride. But notice this little side note. I'm going to Keep moving for the sake of time because this story is so rich. Mordecai did not bow down and pay homage. It would have been so easy for all that Mordecai had done to simply uh, bow down inwardly while he was, or excuse me, bow down outwardly while he was standing inwardly. You know what that looks like, don't you? You ever had a three-year-old? You tell them to sit down, they, they refuse. You force them to sit down. They may not say it with their mouth, but all over their face and their eyes, they're saying, I'm sitting physically, but inwardly I'm standing. <laughs> I mean, Mordecai could have done that. He could have uh, gone along to get along, but he chose to make a ripple in what seemed like a time where God was working like crazy. Mordecai, come on, man. Like, you know, you know there's a couple million other Jews here. They're bowing down, you get that. As far as we see in the story, the only person of note that did not bow down was Mordecai. And as your pride is triggered, we must be reminded that it is never right to do wrong in order to do right. Mordecai knew this. He's like, I mean, I could, I could just kind of compromise here a little bit. I could give in because I see where God's at work and, and I don't want to mess that up. And, and so I'm just going to bow down here and, and, and then maybe, maybe God will bless it anyway. Pride will fool you. It'll convince you that if you just give in a little bit, if you just don't make much of the name of Jesus, if you just kind of do it your way, you can fall for the same temptation. You can blend in. You can choose not to ruffle feathers. You can let your life speak louder than your words. These are all things that we've fallen for before, but I'm telling you, that's the same root of pride that Haman would struggle with. If Mordecai had put his own image, his own standing before, before the work of God, it would have been choosing his pride over anything else. In verse 3, then the servant, the king's servants, who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? See, Mordecai had a little prominence. His, his relative is now married to the king. He's remembered as the guy that saved the king's life, even though that's old yesterday now, and that's, that time has passed. I mean, Mordecai has had his 15 minutes of fame, and they want to know why he's not, he's not obeying the king. Remember, the king said you have to bow. 
And when they spoke to him day after day and he would not listen, this is my favorite part, watch this. They told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand for he had told them that he was a Jew. In other words, they knew why he wasn't bowing. I'm not bowing because I can't bow because the only one I'll bow to is God, which means I'm not gonna bow to Haman. I'm not gonna bow to Xerxes. I'm only gonna bow to God because I am a Jew. And when they heard this, this enraged them so much that they tattletailed on him. They went and said, Haman, everybody's bowing. All the Jews are bowing except for Mordecai. Did you notice Mordecai's not bowing? Now, this may strike a different note for me than it does for you, because I'm currently in the process of raising three boys. And one thing they are experts at is telling on one another. As a matter of fact, if there was an Olympic game for telling on one another, my boys would qualify. <laughs> it drives me nuts the way they... They come and they tell, and they tell on things that they would very likely be guilty of doing any other moment, but in that moment, they're not guilty of it, so they're going to tell on it. And what drives me crazy is not just them telling on their brothers, it's their reaction after they tell on their brothers. They go and sit on the sideline and wait and watch like some sadistic psycho to see what dad's going to do. Like they have no authority in their brother's life, but now, now we've exercised the authority of dad and let's see what's about to happen. Those weirdos, why would you do that? Why? Because misery loves company. And they've learned that. Because if I'm gonna be miserably disobeying dad, then you're gonna be miserable when you do too, even if he doesn't know it. They might've learned that misery loves company. They have not yet learned that snitches get stitches. <laughs> And they will learn that lesson. As my boys get older, I'm confident they will learn that lesson. But listen, these men in verse 3 and 4 clearly were miserable. Misery loves company. They were bowing out of compulsion, not out of admiration. If they loved Haman, if they loved King Xerxes, and they were simply bowing, they would have less care or concern for what Mordecai would do, and, and they would be certain he would be caught by the many. But they thought, if I have to bow, you have to bow. If I'm going to do this, you're going to do this. And if not, you're going to pay the price. Because I don't want to pay the price. But somebody's got to pay the price. Notice this in the story. Haman's pride is already stirring, but he doesn't even yet know that Mordecai is not bowing. Promotion uh, watered the root of pride in his life, but what's going to burst it forth through the ground is the moment of unrecognized and underappreciated status. When, when he realizes that everybody's bowing, but that, that Mordecai is the one who's saying, nope, I don't care who you are, I don't care what position you have, I will not bow. And what does that do? It provokes his pride. See, when you allow promotion in the best days of your life to lead to your pride, it's simmering there, but what will, what will throw gas on that fire is when someone does not walk with you in that success. When somebody doesn't recognize how great you are as much as you recognize how great you are, your pride will go over the top rope. Husbands, if you've ever done something kind for your wife, like the dishes, and she came home, and within moments of arriving, she didn't immediately notice that the dishes were done. You can relate to this moment. The, the trick is you take extra bleach spray, and you spray it around the sink, and you do not wipe it down. You leave it there so the house smells clean when she gets home. That was for free. That is not a part of the sermon, okay? <laughs> Well, you can be so excited about yourself because you did something wonderful in the house and, and you took care of a responsibility that wanted to be taken care of later. And man, you're so pride, pride, prideful and eager about it. And then she doesn't notice. She chooses not to bow down like Mordecai. <laughs> that will not make it to the second sermon. I just thought it would be fun to say that and see how it went. So... <laughs> 
But in that moment, the, the provocation with inside of you, I mean, and listen, this is a funny kind of moment to laugh at, but how many times have you done something? And man, you honestly, you amazed yourself that you were able to start the washing machine. You, you amazed yourself that you were able to pull off the task at work, that you were able to accomplish uh, this, this challenging thing ahead of you, and you thought for sure your boss would notice. You thought for sure your coworkers would appreciate you. You thought for sure your family would recognize what you had done. And, and, and look, you're not asking for over the top credit, you're just asking for reasonable recognition and you get none. Oh man, that pride is gonna overtake you. It'll overtake me. This is what happens in this story. So they go and they tell, they tell Haman exactly what Mordecai is doing. Haman had no knowledge of it before. He was already proud, but now, now he is angry. And in his anger, he comes up with two solutions. Either Mordecai will bow or Mordecai will die. Now that would be a triggered response at the least. I mean, to say like, you're either gonna be with me or I'm gonna kill you would, would be over the top and overreaction, sure. But what if I told you that it did not stop there? What if I told you that because of the authority and the status that he had, because of where he set in his life and in this kingdom, that his pride, as well as your pride, produces immeasurable destruction? See, he didn't just want to kill Mordecai. He wanted to annihilate the Jews. I made a bold statement earlier. I said he'd be in the top three with Hitler, Nero, and then Haman. And we can read right over that, but please don't do this when I show you in a moment that Haman's pride led him to a point that not only did he want to end Mordecai, he wanted to annihilate the Jewish people. He was so angry at one man that the ripple effect would last for all of human history if he had his way. And let me be clear, there was only one person standing in between him and his way, and he thought it was King Xerxes, it happened to be God. See, when you go against God's people, you go against God. And it may not be immediately obvious, it may not be immediately clear, but look at verse five. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. See, pride becomes fury. And he was disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. That wasn't enough, in other words, is what the Bible says. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, the Jewish people, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews and the people of Mordecai throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes, the Hazarus. Now think about this. In this moment, he wants to kill all the Jews. A couple of million of them, gone. No one left. Men, women, children, infants, gone. This is his plan. And in his mind, he only needs the permission of one more person, and that is Xerxes. If he can sit down with him, his pride can be fulfilled, and he'll wipe them off the planet. The problem was, of the couple million Jews that existed, there was one that he did not know was Jewish. And her name was Esther. And so what happens is Esther finds out about this new plan. I'll tell you the rest of the story and you can study these 10 chapters on your own because there is so many layers and levels of richness. But hear me when I say this, Esther knew this can't happen. Not just for her own safety, but for the people of God. However, what can I do? Just a woman 2,500 years ago, yes, a queen of the king, but limited in her even access to him, let alone in her authority to do something about it, what can I do? And so she went, I'm sure spending time with God, talking to Mordecai, and she determined, I have been given this position for such a time as this. Imagine the difference between the promotion that led to pride and the promotion that led to serving God. The only difference is pride versus humility. Esther could have said, look, Jews, it's your problem. I mean, yeah, I'm one of you, but if you had done better, if you had saved more, you could have set up your own camp. We could have moved out of here. I could have already saved you, but I can't help you because you've wasted your life. It's your problem now. She didn't let her pride speak. She saw her people in their plight and she heard this plan, so she... She gained access to her husband. This was risk enough. 
Had, had the queen access to the king without permission and he didn't receive her just like Vashti, she could be banished from the kingdom or she could be killed. I'm sure nervous and filled with anxiety, she went before him and all she requested was a sit down dinner. Could we sit down and have dinner together? You can even bring Haman if you want. What a dinner date to have with your husband and his second in command, but the king obliged and just a couple of days from then they would sit down and they'd have a great banquet. And he was so enthralled, he was so pleased with Esther. He said, you can have anything you want, but in her wisdom, she said, I'm gonna wait to answer this request at dinner. In the meantime, while they're waiting for this banquet, Haman goes and builds these gallows where he's going to, to ultimately hang Mordecai before all the people and set off the, the initiation that will kill all the Jews. He's, he's so excited about his plan. He, he feels like he's finally gonna rise to the position he's always wanted, not just in spot, but in authority. And in the night in between the request and the banquet, the king has problems sleeping. You ever had a problem sleeping and you knew it wasn't your problem, it was God's problem? God was bothering the king and he didn't even know it. I told you, God's not mentioned in this book, but he's over every page. Oh, he was talking to the king. The king knew that something was going on in his life. So he's like, just put me to sleep. Just give me something. And they didn't have podcasts of my preaching available yet. So he said, that won't work. So why don't you go get the books of the Chronicles and bring the history books to him and read me those while I fall asleep. And maybe he was getting a little drowsy. Maybe he thought like, uh, I'm almost there. But right before he fell asleep, they were reading through the last few years and they came upon this man named Mordecai. And they said, Mordecai is a man who saved your life. There was the two guys. Remember, I told you that happened. He was remembered. He was written down in history, but he was never rewarded. And the king said, what was the reward that was given to this man who saved my life? And On that moment, he said, listen, we've got to take care of this guy. So the next day, the king calls in Haman. This is the day before the banquet. He says, hey, I've got this guy in my kingdom, and he needs to be greatly rewarded. I mean, he has done something for the king that no one else could have done. As a matter of fact, I am the king I am today because of this man. What should we do to honor him? See, when pride's in your life, it'll lie to you. Haman thought, Oh, it's finally my moment. Okay. I mean, I'm second in command. I have all the wealths and riches, but I wonder what else I could ask for since the king is trying to honor me here. I mean, clearly the king wouldn't be who he is if it weren't for me. He must be talking about me, Haman. So Haman thought up the most wonderful way to be rewarded. We should take the king's robe and we should wrap it around this man and we should throw a parade for him. Like the most outrageous thing. Who needs a parade with elephants and trombones? And like, we're gonna go out in the street and it's gonna be incredible. And he's just daydreaming in his mind of how awesome this is gonna be. And the king says, Haman, you did it again, man. That is a great idea. That's why you're my number two. Now go get Mordecai because we're gonna honor the guy. (laughs) I'm sorry, king, I must be failing in my left ear. What did you say? Yeah, Mordecai, because he saved my life and we never honored him. We must honor this man. I wouldn't even be alive today if it weren't for that man. So imagine Haman and, and what it did to his pride as he watched this parade that occurred in the king's robe and all this fanfare for this man who he hated. So now he is at blood boil 100. He's going into the banquet. You would think at this moment, this is when he'll have his revenge. It is time for Haman to get his own. And in in this banquet, Esther exposes the plan of Haman. She says he's planning to take Mordecai and hang him. He's planning to do all of these things to the Jewish people. And by the way, Esther said, I am one. When the king learned of this plan, he became outraged by it. So much so, he turns on Haman and he says, you will be hanged from the gallows that you made for Mordecai. And that day, Haman is put to death. I told you in the beginning, That pride will take your best day and it will make it your worst. Pride will take all the life in you and all the success you found and turn it to failure and ultimately turn it to death. 
Look, I don't know what kind of guy Haman was before the promotion. He probably wasn't a guy that you would have enjoyed or wanted to hang out with. But I'm telling you, had it not been for his pride being triggered, had it not been for the lack of humility within him, I do not think he would have found himself hanging from the gallows. But pride and pride alone is the thing that took him all the way there. And so you wonder, as as we kind of wrap this up, So what do I do about my pride? I'm not the number two in the kingdom, but I do feel what you're talking about, Pastor Andrew. When when I have my best days, when I have my best moments, boy, there is a stir within me. What do I I do about that? It's easy to look in this story and try to find yourself, isn't it? I mean, for us guys, we must be Mordecai. I mean, we're not great, but at the end of the day, we're pretty good, and we know a lot of great ladies. That makes us Mordecai. And ladies, I know who you are. You're Esther for such a time as this. But friend, if we're not careful, we'll let let pride into our Bible study. Because in this story, I'm not Mordecai and you're not Esther. In this story, I feel a lot like Haman. I feel like the one that struggles with pride, even though I know I'm not supposed to. And if that's the case, if I'm the guy that keeps messing things up because I keep getting in the way, then who is the Mordecai? Who is the Esther? And the answer in Sunday school is always Jesus. Uh, You may not have known that. In church, the right answer is almost always Jesus. (laughs) See, Jesus is the one who for such a time as this went before the king and said, I will spare them, even the Haman, even the one who I'm asking, forgive him because he doesn't know what he does. And in my pride and the things that trigger me to respond that way, church, hear me on this. We have an advocate, the Bible says. We have one who goes in between us and the great king of all kings, the great Lord of all lords. Jesus goes before the father and says, yes, I know. I know Andrew messed up again because I do it all the time. And he pleads on my behalf and he pleads on your behalf. So just because you hear this story, you think, man, I I don't know if I'm ever gonna get this right because I got so many things that are going right in my life. I got so many triggers to pride, I can't avoid it. Friend, I'm telling you, the Bible says God resists the proud, he gives grace to the humble. Let Christ wrap you in his humility. Sometimes we hear that verse and we think, oh man, I gotta be humble. Look, some of you may be humble by nature, but most of us aren't. Most of us, humility doesn't come natural. And last I checked, there's no blue light specials. There's no buy one, get one on humility at the store. I wish it was, I would stock up with it. And so what do you do when it says God gives grace to the humble? Because I don't feel very humble. But the Bible says in Philippians that Jesus humbled himself. He, he stepped down from heaven, fully God. He put on fully man, the flesh of us. And he, and he took on this humility and he went to the cross, the most humble place on planet earth. And he hung between heaven and earth and he took every sin you've ever committed, every sin I'll ever commit. And he hung it on himself and he died. He shed his blood and he died to pay for those sins. There is no greater definition of humility, friend. And then three days later, he arose. He walked out of that grave. And friend, I'm telling you, I'm telling you today that that humility can be draped all over you. And every time like Haman and every time like Andrew and every time like you, that we stir into pride, man, we can go back to Jesus. He can take us to the foot of the cross and he can put his humility all over us. And God will pour his grace and his mercy on us once again pray with me today. Father, God, we love you and I thank you that with every failure, the Bible says there's more grace. Where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Lord, we ought not walk out of here discouraged, defeated, deflated, but but Lord, that we can be edified and uplifted. Lord, because you were made low. You wrap us in your righteousness and your humility. And Lord, I I wanna be aware of the triggers in my life. I want our church to be aware of the things in our church and our community and our lives that could cause us to look at ourselves, that could cause us to promote me, to promote I, 
when Lord, there's only one who is worthy, only one who is deserving of the credit and it is you. Lord, in that reminder today, may we be made strong in our weaknesses through your strength and your strength alone. God, if there is one here today who does not know you, Lord, I pray they would reject their own pride. They would turn from their sin, Lord, and they would fall into the grace of the cross. Lord, the power of the resurrection, this is what we proclaim over us today. That they would not leave this place without knowing you as Savior. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. Pastor Chad, you come. All right, well, thank you for that, Pastor Andrew. What a word of encouragement. Um, don't forget, if you filled out your Connect card, man, we would love to connect with you. You can stop by the Next Steps table. You can drop that off or see Pastor Andrew, and we have a gift card uh, to Duck Donuts. And then a couple things that will be coming up on May the 14th. It's Mother's Day. So, guys, gave you uh, plenty of notice uh, to get things in order for that day. Uh, but uh, around here on Mother's Day, it's a special day. And one thing we do on our Mother's Day is we do family dedication. And uh, if you have not dedicated your family, whether your child is a week old or, or school age, it doesn't matter. Uh, we would love for you on that day to participate in our family dedication. You know, I really like the way we do it. Uh, growing up uh, in the churches I was in, uh, we had baby dedication. Uh, but what we're doing is we're dedicating the whole family uh, because we believe that the Bible teaches that we are to train up a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. Uh, now, I get Along the way, uh, we all have our own choices to make, and sometimes our, our kids make choices. But what we do on that day is we say, hey, as a family, uh, we want to commit uh, our family to the Lord and that we're going to raise our children uh, in a gospel way. And uh, as a church, we want you praying for us as a family. So uh, you can go uh, to our website uh, at parkviewlpga.com. And uh, you can register for that. You can see the QR code there as well. You can uh, uh, click on that. And uh, just register. Uh, we will contact you and give you all the details. We'll do it in both services. So you can register for one of those services. And uh, just make Mother's Day a very, very special day uh, that day. And then also, uh, some of you have been asking. And uh, we, uh, it's right around the corner. Uh, we have our next membership luncheon. It's on May 20th, okay? So uh, many of you join last August uh, whenever we launched as an autonomous church and uh, we're so excited about that but we've had so many people come since then that on May 20th is your next opportunity uh, to uh, become a member of Parkview uh, it will be at the Holiday Inn we'll have a luncheon You'll hear what we believe, uh, our vision, uh, and what it means to be a member of Parkview. And uh, then on that day, you can make a choice on whether or not you want to join with us uh, in membership. So you can go as well online, uh, parkviewlpga.com. Go to our events page and register for that as well. There will be child care provided. You'll see that. Just register your children for child care as well. And uh, it's going to be a great, great day. And uh, we look forward uh, to you joining uh, with us on the mission of life change. Okay? Uh, it's been a great day. We look forward to seeing you next week. Y'all have a great week. Bye-bye.